We'll call the March 18, 2024, Auburn City Council workshop to order. First item of business or department presentations and council discussion. The first presenter will be Auburn Public Library. Good evening. My name is Donna Wallace. I have worked at the Auburn Public Library for 12 years now. Uh, first off, starting as teen librarian, then adult services manager. Since December, in addition to my role as adult services manager, I have been filling in as the interim director of APL. Hi, I'm Mike. Hi, I'm Michael Malloy, and I'm here uh, as president of the library. It's a pleasure to darken your doorstep once again. So I thought I'd, I know most of you probably know some about the library, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of background of some things that have been going on recently there. Um, so as you may know, uh, we're open six days a week, uh, Mondays from 9 to 7, Tuesdays through Fridays from 9 to 6, and Saturdays 9 to 5, which represents 54 hours a week. Our Saturday schedule is modified in the summer between Memorial Day and Labor Day. We close at 1 p.m. on Saturdays during that time. We currently have 7,100 active customers, that is library card holders. This number re reflects an increase of 16% over this time last year. Our collection size is currently at 91,144 items. This includes books, audiobooks, music CDs, and DVDs for adults, teens, and children. Our circulation as of the end of February, so far in fiscal year 2024, is 50,184 items. The daily visit averages about 297 customers. In addition to books, we offer museum and park passes uh, including most recently a uh, pass to the Portland Museum of Art and in the summers to the Coastal Maine Bo Botanical Gardens. We also offer checkout for telescopes, do-it-yourself craft kits, board games, Roco sticks, which are movie streaming devices, and personal hotspots. <coughs> we offer cloud library for downloadable ebooks and audiobooks and movie streaming via Canopy. Customers come to the library a lot to use our computers, so I just wanted to highlight a little bit of that as well. On the second floor, we offer 14 public internet computers, which can be accessed with a library card or a guest pass. Customers can use those things for things like accessing email, per perusing the internet, or checking social media. We also offer a computable lab with use restricted for those doing job search, schoolwork, and or research. We also offer digital literacy classes in that room. All computers are connected to a printer, which prints in black and white or color, for which we charge a nominal fee. Additionally, we have a Create Media Lab, which is Macintosh-based, with software for photo or film editing or the creation of music. We have three study and meeting rooms on the second floor that accommodate up to six people. They may be used on a walk-in basis or may be reserved up to two hours at a time, up to two weeks in advance. The library offers many different kinds of programming and outreach for children, teens, and adults. In February alone, we hosted 98 different groups with a total attendance of 1,392 individuals. Many of these programs are made possible through community partnerships. Our mission to bring people, resources, and ideas together to engage, enlighten, and enrich the community is evident every day at the Auburn Public Library. You have our, I believe you have our budget summary document that's been submitted to the council, is that? Uh, we have the, uh, we just have the line item on the home page. Right, yep. so we're, we're seeking funding of $1,199,897, which represents a 5% increase over last year. We'll be happy to answer any specific questions you may have. Great, are the questions um, from the council? Council White. How'd the uh, Marjorie Schuler uh, 
art sale end up Sunday, uh, Saturday? It was great. We had 27 paintings uh, for sale. Um, some of them started around $40, some around 60 I think um, before any overhead, about 2100 All 27 w sold. So it, it was really successful for the first time. Yep. For any those other? who don't know, that's a, a bequest that the library received from a patron who passed who was a very avid watercolor paint, uh, painter. And she left literally hundreds of watercolor paintings to the library. And those are being used and sold on a periodic basis uh, for fundraising. Not all at once, but every so often we'll be doing those. They're really beautiful. And if you have an opportunity in the library and you see them around, do check those out. Council Walker. Could you touch on the highlights on the 5% increase, please? Sure. Um, so one of the things that we've been trying to do, um, the Maine Library Association recently um, did a study of uh, the pay, the salary for all of the Maine libraries, um, wages and salaries. And from that, um, what we noticed is that we're lagging a little bit behind. Um, so I would say a significant portion of that is going back towards salaries and wages to try to get us a little bit more competitive in the field. I'll just say that um, we have noticed where we were below market, and we've been addressing that. Some of that has happened through filling vacancies internally. Uh, others are market adjustments. Uh, our, our overall um, salary is about a little under 800000 uh, Also included within that line item would be health insurance costs and also adding in the retirement, which previously hadn't been um, budgeted in the same way. So this, this breaks that out and includes that in that cost, whereas that had been sort of assumed. But in the past, it, it hasn't always been explicitly budgeted in the same way that it is now. Council Walker. Uh, for your donations, are you on target or are you down this year? Um, we're, we've been lagging a little bit behind, but I'm hopeful that we'll catch up by the end of the fiscal year. Other questions? Councillor Geary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Will we be getting a hard copy for our books of, for their budget? Yeah, what, what you'll see uh, for the library is usually just a, um, a line item amount. We do have a page that we put in the old books that would have, um, again, just a line item. It was never a detail amount that we would have in there. But um, so that's what you'll see when you do. When I present my budget next week, you're going to see that within that line item. I guess I'm outdated because years back it seemed like we had a breakdown of what their budget was. Yeah, when I went back, it was several years ago, you had that breakdown. Uh, in the most recent few years, it's been just a, a line item that is passed through from the board uh, recommendation to the council for a budget amount. Okay, uh, but I still would like to see a hard copy of the breakdown of what their request is for and stuff. Yeah, I'm sure I can get that from Donna. Other questions? Okay. Council Walker. Are we carrying a CIP for the Auburn Library, or is it someone else? You, no, we are. Uh, that was under um, Derek's presentation regarding, um, I think there were two items, uh, both related to HVAC and boiler. Yes. So. yes. No, they, that's it. Any other questions, Count? Yeah, uh, just a point of clarification. So with the budget for the library, are we is our responsibility uh, on that total amount, or would we need to respond to a breakdown? Is it similar to school, or it's not similar to school? You okay. could um, you could provide input uh, back. What's nice about the library is they have a they have a governing board, and so it's it's helpful to be able to if there's a target amount that you're looking to reach, it's best to go to the uh, board and say this is this is what we need for a reduction, and the board would come up with. Thank you. Could I just add just one more point? The amount that we're seeking is not our entire budget, just to be clear what that is. Okay. 
uh, just to make sure that, that everyone's aware, so the library is different from a departmental request, right? Because the library is a separate entity that's making a request to the city to fund part of their budget on an annual basis. Other questions or comments? That's why I was asking about that, because <laughs> okay, I, I just didn't know, uh, you know what we were really providing guidance on. Thank you. Other questions, comments? No, thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll move on to human resources. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Christine Muma. I'm the Director of Human Resources. Um, I guess I'm in charge of this. In our department, um, we have two human resource specialists, um, Sherry Buck, who is the benefits specialist who's in charge of setting up and maintaining benefits. She oversees the payroll um, in the uh, beginning stages of payroll and also is our wellness coordinator who oversees the wellness program as well as um, uh, keeps the records of all employees who are required to participate in our wellness um, program as well. Um, Chandra Elliott is another human resource specialist who specializes in recruitment and orientation. Um, so she does the start to finish uh, from when an employee applies right down to when they are hired. Um, and she also oversees um, maintaining the workers' comp records for the city of Auburn and making sure that employees are going to appointments and following through with the, uh, the providers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, since 2019, COVID brought about many challenges to employers all across the U.S., um, and we were no different. And we had to come up with new ideas on how to recruit people. Uh, we reached out to colleges and universities and technical schools, both in-state and out-of-state, um, to see what we could do to attract people for public service jobs like police uh, studies, criminal justice studies, or fire science schools, as well as uh, planners or uh, engineers, things like that, to try and recruit people. Um, I didn't put the numbers here, but back in 2022, for comparison, we had a total of 396 applications total for the calendar year of 2022. So our recruitment efforts have definitely increased as we, um, in 2023, received 1,005 applications. Um, we had 45 new hires. Of that, 17 we assumed from the school department, their maintenance and custodian positions, as well as we had seven people that we hired from outside of the state of Maine. We're always pushing for more Maine or more people to move into the state. And um, we had a total of five um, BIPOC, uh, black indigenous people of color. So a considerable difference from the year before. Our major budget drivers, um, training and tuition. Um, we uh, joined the Maine Workforce Development Compact um, which is part of the Alphon grant funds um, uh, that covers up to 50% of tuition, uh, both for colleges and also for trainings uh, for um, any of our employees. Um, it also covers college classes as well. Um, additionally, we partnered with the technical colleges and the community colleges for some of the free courses that they were um, uh, offering um, that helped our employees get their uh, certifications in some areas, as well as partnering um, with the Department of Labor for apprenticeship programs. We currently do have a um, arborist apprenticeship uh, right now at the Public Works, um, who is a high school senior that is learning to be an arborist and will continue on to work for the city of Auburn. Um, 
This uh, budget also contains um, training for smaller departments within the city that may not have a large training budget. Um, we um, assist them for some of the cost of their trainings if they need it. And it also covers the training for the HR staff as well. Uh, advertising, um, we do most of our advertising is free. Um, we haven't spent a lot of our advertising uh, monies for this year. However, uh, we occasionally have to use outside vendors such as New Hampshire and Massachusetts uh, municipal associations of even though we have May Municipal uh, that offers free advertising for us because we're a menu, uh, member, uh, we do have to pay to advertise in those states as well as the International City Managers Association uh, job postings which we often will use for positions like let's say a city planner or a city engineer um, again to try and attract people from out of state as well as in-state hires. Uh, we offer EAP for all employees anyways, but we also run our rehabilitation program for those employees who test positive on drug tests. Uh, I increased the budget a little bit this year. I, we go years without having to pay for counseling, um, and then we'll have a year where somebody will test positive. Um, so I've increased it a little bit with the legalization of marijuana. There's more opportunities uh, for people to maybe make a mistake. Um, so and in that instance, we have to pay for the counseling for that employee first, um, and then um, they, they have to continue on in a program until they're um, considered rehabbed. Going back to COVID 2019 to 2022, you may have heard the term, the great resignation. Um, this is across the US again. Uh, people were either laid off from their jobs or quit their jobs due to COVID. Um, and people seemed to like that staying home, they were getting paid. Um, that kind of ended after 18 months of collecting unemployment benefits. and. Uh, realizing that, boy, I shouldn't have quit my job. <laughs> I need my job back. And we were no exception. We did see some people leave employment there as well. The city, like all employers across the U.S., um, had to rethink when it came to hiring how we're going to um, attract new people to our positions. So we looked at things like, you know, offering... Um, um, flex time, flexing our schedules, uh, remote working for some people, especially parents who had lost their daycares and now had to be home on Wednesday afternoon because the schools um, were closed. Um, and then also education and training opportunities as well. So uh, by providing these opportunities, we were able to attract uh, more employees. And you saw the numbers from 20. 23 that that did definitely make a difference um, we actually um, the great regret if you uh, across the US has seen that employees regretted quitting they lost their longevity they lost their vacation time and so people started reapplying and we saw that as well and Auburn saw an increase of 7% of people who left employment with us and um, have come back to work for us again. I just got a phone call last week from somebody who left and is looking to come back, but I don't have the position open anymore. The HR office does the workers' compensation for the city of Auburn. Um, the one's uh, workers' comp um, that is specifically uh, important to us, all, all workers' comp is, uh, but the, the city of Auburn is self-insured. Uh, meaning that we pay the medical bills that come in. Um, currently, the state of Maine has the presumption laws on the books, uh, the cardiac presumption law, the cancer presumption law uh, for fire, cardiac for police and fire, and PTSD also for police and fire. Um, the city is working on the prevention side of both the cardiac and the cancer side to try and um, do what we can before um, somebody gets diagnosed with either 
a cardiac claim or a cancer claim. Um, this involves both the, the new screening tests that both police and fire are doing, as well as building the public safety building, which um, we've reduced that exposure to carcinogens uh, for the firefighters um, by moving their sleeping quarters away from their turnout gear or from the bays of the trucks. Um, in addition to that, um, we have a strong uh, support team for both police and fire um, for PTSD. Uh, with the shooting in October, we saw about nine cases of PTSD um, on the books, and that was a major trigger for PTSD. However, PTSD can also be cumulative, and so we, um, the support teams help those employees who on a day-to-day -day basis see traumatic events that, you know, start wearing on them. The presumption law has a huge impact on the budget, as you can see. Normally, our claim ratings go below 200,000, and you see that pretty much with 2019, 2020, 22, and 23. But you see in 2021, the budget went up over a million dollars. That particular year, we had two claims uh, that brought that number up. One was for a cardiac claim and one was for a cancer claim. So you can see, um, you know, sh trying our best to mitigate some of those ahead of time is gonna produce better results in the long run. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions from the council? Council Whiting. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I was looking at that astonishing you know, number of 1,000 applicants, and then I thought there are probably a lot of internet sort of spam type applicants. I just because it kind of floored me in the yeah. difficulty of hiring environment we're in. Yeah, so we have a lot of people who apply, um, and we have seen an uptick in people who have had applied. So those are legitimate applicants. Um, you may see that a lot of the people, let's say, for example, we just um, hired an accounting assistant. Um, so you may have people who worked at a store, you know, who ran the cash register, and they apply for some of those positions. Um, so we have a lot of people who aren't necessarily qualified educationally applying for some jobs. Um, but in the previous year, um, we took a look at a lot of those applicants because we found a lot of people weren't qualified for the job. Uh, we're very fortunate that as we've put a real big push in that recruitment side, that people are um, actually taking a look at Auburn as a, a great place to work. So we want to be the best employer in the state. How's that? Does that work, Phil? <laughs> Other Any questions? Other? Council Mills. Yeah, that must, it takes a lot of time to go through a thousand applications. It does, remember that's for the whole year. So <laughs> uh, we tend to get, and again, we have um, a benefit spe or a, a HR specialist who's dedicated to just that. Uh, we tend to get roughly about 20 applications a day, um, but there could be, um, so police and fire were constantly recruiting on that end just to get the applications on file. Um, but it could be, you know, three jobs, it could be five jobs that are open at that time. So as positions, another good example is the equipment operators tend to uh, come and go as well. So I would say roughly about 20 applications a day that we get. Again, not all of them are qualified. We do get some, to answer your point, Council Whiting, we do get some from overseas. And those we know right off, actually, um, you know, we may scan them to make sure that they're legitimate overseas, but we don't include those in the pool. Other questions from the council? Uh, on the budget, mm -hmm. you've got a 14% increase in salaries. In, I don't, do you want to address that? <laughs> and then a big increase in professional development. So that's that training budget. So all of our trainings are in that one particular line item. Right. But last year it was 84 and this year it's 13 too. Is some of that uh, increase 
coming from the consolidation from other departments that we talked about in other lines? Uh, maybe a couple of those are in there. We do provide some training in that line item for some departments that don't necessarily provide regular ongoing training. Then it's in the HR HR line item. The um, the key on you know even though you know yeah it's showing a 19 I think it was about a 19 percent variance. Um, you know that's that's only about 1,600 dollars. Not a lot of training hours in that. One thing that Chris's team does a good job at doing is working with the state of Maine to offset a lot of the trainings by almost a 50% match on some of our training that we provide, especially if we're looking at some of the training that we do at Public Works is probably the one that probably uh, takes advantage of that the most. Uh, so we do work that through. When it comes for the staff salaries, you're, you're looking at a couple years worth of salaries posted in that line item. That's not those three individuals did not receive a 14% <coughs> wage increase. That's over a couple of years of increases. Okay, and so we went from on the train on the professional development, 4,500 in 2023, actual, and now we're requesting 13.2. That's almost 10 grand. The sorry, I'm looking at my budget. Um, yeah, you'll see. I think it was 80. 84 was what. In 23. Right. 24. Yep. Yeah, so a lot of that is the rolling in from the other departments. So some of those departments are rolling those in. But the other piece that we did was we rolled out some, there was like three other line items within mm -hmm. these budgets. They were all broken out like travel uh, was in there. Um, that had to do with travel for training. And so we rolled those all in. So when you see that 8,000, it's probably three other line items that then got rolled up to that line item. So you're comparing. So the real increase that the request is the, the difference between that 8,400. We rolled those line items up as well. So that's the true amount. Uh, but when you look at that previous year, that 45, it's not taking that into account. Um, but you'll see the 13,250 is a uh, is the roll up of those other accounts. For for Chris's department, they probably um, they spend a great deal of time in our MUNA system, and so. Uh, so they're attending some of that MUNIS training, plus they're also attending uh, state conferences regarding HR uh, requirements that they need to make sure they're meeting as far as they provide a, a, the front line of a lot of legal uh, matters when it comes to uh, our personnel um, that either is, whether it's a complaint, a grievance, um, internal affairs investigation, that they, they help coordinate those as well as some of our hiring practices as well. That also includes our certifications also and membership dues. So um, we're members of the main local um, HR group. Um, we also are members of SHRM. Um, so it maintains that certification for us as well, as well as ICMA. That's all in that same line item. Thank so you. I think in your portal, you'll be able to click on that and it'll give you that detail. Okay. Uh, Kelsey's not with us tonight, but if we, she was putting that up on the screen right now, you'll see which ones are dues associated relation because I look at that as all professional development. So that's why we've started moving those all into that line item. Yeah. Other questions from the council? Uh, given the, the uh, risk exposure here on the workers' compensation costs uh, from the presumption um, requirements that we now have, for the police and fire department, are there fitness standards that are imposed on the um, employees, either through HR or contract, to help reduce that risk? Do you want me to answer? So uh, both departments do have fitness standards. Um, and once they've passed all those things, they also go through a pre-employment physical. Um, police um, has to take a main criminal justice Academy exam physical agility test and fire also runs their own agility test. They're pretty tough Right, and that that's it Right as a new hire, correct? That's a new hire. And then what, the what about new, ongoing? What once they're hired on an ongoing basis? Yeah, yeah um, Currently neither uh, collective bargaining agreement has uh, those standards other than if there is a fitness for duty concern then they work through HR yeah. uh, on an individual um, and then they go through our work med um, process to be evaluated, determine their fitness of duty. 
Uh, we do have within the uh, collective bargaining agreement a um, health insurance uh, wellness program. And so there's certain elements that they need to participate in for the wellness program uh, to receive a reduced discount on their health insurance. And so, uh, but none of those have to necessarily meet a, a physical test, uh, fitness test. It's more about attending training, learning, education. It's all related to that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to planning and permitting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, happy to be here tonight to go over the proposed budget for FY25 for planning and permitting. Um, we are a department of 10 staff. Um, there is an 11th position proposed uh, for a long range planning position. Uh, we currently have um, two code officers. You'll see there's only nine, uh, nine plus the proposed one up there, but we have two code officers filling the code compliance officer position. Um, we have uh, slightly fewer staff than we did in 2002. Uh, and before that, we had a couple of extra staff. I think in large part, we've been able to uh, work through that process more permit volumes than we did back then uh, because of our GIS um, providing information. There's a lot more available online to people as well as uh, uh, we will be moving to an online permitting software that'll make it easier for people to, to apply. The department is really sort of split between a couple of divisions, um, functional divisions. Um, first being planning, um, that portion of our department handles uh, zoning, comprehensive planning, um, prioritizing some capital needs to reach those long-term planning goals, uh, development reviews, so individual project site plan reviews, uh, subdivision reviews, uh, department management, uh, personnel uh, related issues for the department are handled by the same staff in the planning division, uh, myself as well as um, our code compliance officer lead. Uh, and we do spend a lot of time as well prepping information for public meetings. Um, over the last few years, we've, we've spent more time with the amount of times that we're in front of the city council and planning board uh, with planning related issues prepping for those meetings. The, uh, the extra position that's in the budget um, is related to long range planning. And I, I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I wanted to highlight that the the day to day work of the planning department responding to customer calls, uh, potential development calls asking what what can I do with this property or uh, what do I need to do to expand my business or to add on to my home. Um, those calls as well as the prepping uh, deadlines for prepping for meetings. Um, and development reviews have eaten up more and more of our time over time, and we have not been able to put as much time into the longer range planning um, as we think that we should um, and would like to be able to by dealing with those immediate deadlines. Um, and that's the primary reason for that extra position. Um, permitting and code compliance, um, as you might imagine, uh, that is the portion of our department that deals with building permit applications, uh, plumbing, electrical, uh, sign permits, um, all things permitting for construction uh, on a site. Um, building inspections, uh, those are kind of split between permits and code compliance, but that's the active inspection program uh, to review for compliance with plans that are already approved um, or to follow up on issues at buildings where somebody may not be maintaining their building uh, to the level that's required by the code. Um, and that leads into the code compliance division um, there are staff that are actively looking for issues at properties. Um, although a lot of our code compliance is driven by complaints, um, we follow up on all, all complaints related to building code compliance uh, with code compliance staff. There is um, really one line item that makes up the vast majority of our budget and that's uh, staff salaries. Uh, about 95% of our budget is staff salaries. Um, our business is really people uh, working with people uh, to either provide information 
um, help them comply with ordinances or long range plans and to work with people that don't comply to try to encourage them to comply. Um, our other budget line items are a relatively small portion of our budget being 5% um, and pretty lean, I think, overall uh, as far as uh, other costs being only 5%. As I mentioned, the uh, long range planner position is um, our intent is to have a person that can focus. Uh, we, we believe that there's a good chance that we'll be working on a new comprehensive plan over the next year. Uh, we've proposed that in our CIP. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what I really envision for this position is that person would lead the consultant um, through that process and then would be able to focus on implementing that plan um, as well as other more long-range plans. Um, we're doing a lot of transportation plans. Uh, I think Jonathan Labonte is going to talk to you about that. Um, we absolutely expect there'll be implementation items to come out of those. Uh, we're doing a number of um, zoning changes uh, related to Lake Auburn. We've been working on a lot of the implementation of form-based codes um, and we could do more as far as proposing capital improvement items to you and managing those long-term plan goals um, with another person that, I don't want to say hides from the phone and emails, but doesn't get um, their day filled up with the day-to-day -day requests for information and um, calls or complaints, as well as um, um, reviewing active projects uh, that are due this month or this week. Um, other budget changes, we did increase our advertising cost line item. We've done that each of the past couple of years, and we do anticipate that we'll be a little bit over this year. And those advertising costs are largely public notices and mailings um, that depending on how many, um, how many petitions we get, how many council initiated zoning changes, how many planning board initiated zoning changes, um, we have to meet those notice requirements, and we've had a higher volume of those over the past uh, number of years and try to keep up with that. Um, the uh, removal of vehicle-related expenses, you'll see that, that item uh, dropped out of our budget, and that's moved to public works. The proposed FY25 CIP, as I mentioned, includes comprehensive plan update rewrite. Um, we've had a long-standing item in our CIP called Comp Plan Acquisition and Implementation. Um, what that account in a typical year is used for is so that um, in this year where you, some of you were newly elected, um, this would be the money that is available for you to prioritize things in our existing comp plan. Um, over the course of that fir first ter term. If we didn't have this, then it would really be well into your second term before you had funding that you could appropriate for implementing those items. Um, this year, we anticipate that there's a good chance that you'll choose to spend some of that on an updated comprehensive plan. Um, we've done some preliminary budget estimates with a couple of consultants. Um, we think it's going to be in the neighborhood of 200000 for a comprehensive plan update. Uh, that would take 18 to 24 months, most likely. And depending on the level of public engagement uh, that you want, um, that would be anywhere from 150 to 250,000 with a higher level of public engagement um, costing more money for that, for that effort. The remainder would be available to implement any priorities during the development of that comprehensive plan, so really working from the existing plan. Um, but would be uh, available for you to appropriate and we don't. Um, staff doesn't just decide how to spend that. We bring those items back to the council um, for dictating how it actually gets spent during that budget year. Um, the other large CIP item is dangerous buildings and cleanups. Um, that's a combination of if there's a fire and somebody who's unresponsive um, and the city needs to take action to demolish a building, um, we use that money for that. Um, if there are dangerous buildings that we become aware of during the time, uh, we use that money for the demolition of those buildings, um, as well as uh, for junkyard cleanups. We've done a number of large, long-term illegal junkyard cleanups over the last five years, and we really have one significant one left that uh, we're hoping to tackle over the next year to two um, at Hackett Road. Recent efforts, um, 
form-based zoning has been expanded to uh, many areas of the city, uh, providing more flexibility for the types of housing um, and more traditional development patterns. Um, over the last year in 2023, that's calendar year 2023, um, increased housing units by about 213. Uh, we spent a lot of time on Lake Arbor and watershed protection efforts and um, significant uptick in sort of special projects that we're involved in. Um, the city has a lot of capital needs, a lot of buildings that are nearing the end of their useful life uh, because of the time frame that they were originally built in. Uh, we'll be working with the city as a whole on some of those. Um, 186 Main Street was a big one for a redevelopment project and a Brownfields grant to get that site ready uh, that we played a role in as well as other departments. Um, we are finally addressing the garage at Rowley's Diner that was uh, promised as part of a land swap uh, over 12 years ago uh, where the city acquired some of the land behind that building in the back half of it. Um, and the PAL Center has been one that is a special project the city's uh, had staff engagement on over the past year. Uh, we issued a little over a thousand permits. Um, that's fairly typical for the past few years, but it's up quite a bit from five or ten years ago. Um, what we had for numbers, and that includes building, plumbing, electrical, and sign permits. Um, with electrical being the highest volume permit um, in most years, um, but uh, building permits being the highest value permits, the highest cost of construction. Um, and fees collected a little over 200,000 in permit and development review fees uh, during the, that 2023 calendar year. Um, we are working on a different way of estimating construction costs. I think it's been consistent over the years that people tend to undervalue their projects when they're applying for a permit, uh, the number that they put for construction costs, typically lower than what we believe it to be. Um, it's been a comparison because we've calculated, calculated the same way, um, but we're looking at other estimating um, ways um, using standards that an insurance adjuster would use, that kind of thing, to double check those values. Uh, people assume that their permit fee and their taxes are directly linked to that value, so I think there's an incentive there for people to undervalue those, but we will be working on um, a better way to add, more accurately value those based on today's construction costs uh, with the implementation of our new permitting software that has some of those systems built in. Um, so this year to next year, um, may not be a good comparison of apples to apples, but we may have to make some adjustments to try to compare those to prior years that were calculated this way. Trends over that period, um, we've seen a significant increase since uh, fiscal year 16 in the amount of permit value. Um, some of that has been consistent with the volume of permits increase, increasing. Um, some of that, obviously, if you tried to build or renovate recently, um, the same project just costs more as well. Um, but we have been adding a lot more housing units during that time frame um, and still had pretty consistent industrial or commercial growth. Uh, current permits uh, so far uh, this fiscal year, uh, that's FY24, so July 1st till now, uh, is about 43 million, almost 44 million. Um, what you see in this graph at 65 million um, is just a mathematical projection of what that would mean for the remainder of the year. Uh, we do have some larger projects that are on the horizon that we expect um, some of those to make it to permitting and approval before June 30th. Um, that may bump that number to be another record this year, more than the 74 million. It depends which ones come in before and after June 30th. Um, but I would like to point out that the overall construction value um, I would say that the top 10 to 15 percent of the permits are 90 percent of the value. So there's really a, a dozen or a handful of really large projects bumps that value for the year, even if the thousand approximately permits stays stays pretty consistent. A few large ones really bump that that investment value for the year. Looking ahead to this year, um, we do. Uh, plan to launch our new permitting software, and this will, for the first time, bring us um, online application capabilities. Um, that's going to do two things. Um, it is um, similar to our GIS. It's going to make that available, that information available to the public, whether they're applying or trying to look at what is going on in their neighborhood. 
um, without a call to City Hall and without a freedom of information request that has to be processed by staff. So people will hopefully be able to find that when they want it, whether we're open or not, uh, nights, weekends, weekdays. Um, and that's really helped us provide uh, GIS information. We're open for the same on permitting and development review information. It's also going to allow for the applicant, instead of spending their time uh, filling out a paper application, they can spend their time filling out the online application, and that's going to offload that work from a staff person having to re-enter that information and gain some efficiencies there. Um, migration of records into GIS is a project that we're working on. Um, that was uh, funded last year. Uh, we're working on scanning and digitizing a lot of records and then making them available through GIS in the same way that, um, I don't know if you're familiar with our plan file archive, but that is a layer on GIS um, that allows you to look at a lot of older plans, subdivision plans, development reviews, uh, street construction plans. Incredible resource, kind of sets us apart from other places in the state. Um, it actually can make it cheaper for somebody to hire a consultant to do their project here because all that stuff's available um, without spending a lot of hours looking for it. We're trying to make that more robust. Um, we think GIS is the platform that's here to stay, um, so we're trying to work within that platform um, to make these records available for the long term so they can't be uh, lost as paper copies and they're available anytime. Um, LD-2003, um, we've done a lot to conform with LD-2003. Um, we still have some more work to do, in particular in our rural zones um, or non-form-based code zones um, that are within our growth area um, and across the board on adopting some new parking standards related to affordable housing. Uh, we have our first meeting, task meeting with the planning board uh, committee tomorrow night with a couple of members. Um, we'll hopefully have those shelled out within a month or two and then coming back through a process for the council to look at as well. Um, we'll be proposing that we do what's required by LD 2003 and then um, if there's something more that the council wants to do then you could tell us that through that process. Um, committee support, land use transportation studies. Um, we have a number of committees right now um, tasked through multiple departments. Uh, we're working to support those. Um, and we have a number of transportation studies coming up that really have a strong land use component. Um, so we'll be making sure that our staff is helping to support those um, in addressing the land use pieces of the, the transportation studies. And prep for a new comprehensive plan. Um, it's hard to believe that that has been um, a full 10 years. It feels like it was just yesterday that um, I know Rick was in those meetings. We were meeting multiple times a month, um, a really robust uh, process at that time, and that was adopted in April of 2011. And here we are um, with the consistency findings set to expire this year in May, and we hope that you'll support updating that plan so we have a new, a new playbook for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions from the council? Council Mill. Can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, increase in the salaries? It's pretty substantial. Yeah, so the um, increase in the salaries, and I'm just pulling up that budget on my phone. I'm not uh, checking messages or anything, but um, there is a new position um, that a long range planner position um, in looking at the market um, that's probably in the neighborhood of eighty thousand uh, dollars to get somebody who's qualified that can work and run those meetings yep. um, and work through that process and the remainder of the increase is um, adjustments that have been made in the budget um, based on our departments kind of split between MSEA union um, and non-union positions um, the remainder of that is adjustments made in this year's budget to to meet the salary requirements and Eric I think you had a portion of the GIS position in that salary line item so the um, it's not included in this year's budget because we're still using the ARPA project based funds to digitize those records um, so I didn't I didn't include so that, that position that you see regarding GIS so that's not in that salary line item uh, so that is out of us out of a, the ARPA account 
Okay. I will I will verify that, but I'm pretty sure that is not in that in this year's budget as a salary line item. It's just the project based budget that has an end date. Okay. And so do we anticipate that being a cliff or is that gonna position gonna go away? We'll have to evaluate it. I think that, you know, we we just hired a person to start that work. I think we'll we'll continue to see the uh, the progress that's being done there. Yeah. And uh, because that's that digitization that Eric was talking about of yeah. trying to put all those plans into a, into the system. We have uh, we have uh, stacks and stacks of those that need to be brought on board. Yeah, and I'll say that I, I met with Eric about a project and it yeah. was very helpful having all that stuff online mm -hmm. and the, 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 the department's doing a good job. But it's, it's hard to quantify the benefit of yes. that, but we do hear from people that it saved them a lot of time and if they can get the information that makes them comfortable to do their project here, when they're looking at multiple sites, I think it does make a difference. Uh, Eric, that, that, that's in addition to the GIS position that maintains GIS on a forward going basis. This is a project based position. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, okay. For digitizing the planning, permitting, assessing records that we have in our, in our department space. Great, yeah. thank you. Other questions from the council? Council White. Um, I saw the bottle gas, and then that made me think bottle gas, and it must be the electrician's barn, and then that made me think about the electrician. That was from 2023. Um, that's obviously been taken over citywide, um, but it made me start thinking about that building, and it's it's an old building, and it's like a nerve center for fire alarms and other things. And the I'm electrical. Yeah, yeah. Just what the status of that is, if there's any CIP. And you know needs there or anything yeah. of that sort. So we have moved the maintenance component. Um, we used to manage the streetlight traffic signal maintenance um, component um, as well as uh, the electricity for streetlights out of the planning and permitting office. The maintenance component and the utilities have all been moved to public works. We still have the electrical inspector. Um, we are working this year, um, and I think you'll see something in Derek's facility CIP related to this. Um, to stop providing municipal fire alarm services. Um, that is provided out of that building, the sort of brains of that system. Um, it's very antiquated. Um, it has sort of a paper ticker tape type of uh, record keeping um, that's constantly spitting out a, a ticker tape. Um, there are so many other options now for fire alarm systems that are as good, if not better, um, and less expensive to maintain over time that we're looking to abandon that system. We've notified all of the sus subscribers um, on that system. They were both city buildings as well as private subscribers. And um, we've given them until June 30th to be off of that system. Um, and then we'll phase that out. It may take a little longer to phase out the city buildings, but um, when we phase that out, then we're hoping that that building is no longer needed for city operations. Yeah, the city's working through uh, a couple of vendors to see exactly what the cost will be because it's not just um, just the city side of these uh, buildings that we need to uh, connect with a fire alarm system but also all the schools and so um, so you'll probably see that in phases the first year is to, is to move uh, as Eric said regarding those that we work through because that connects directly to the uh, 911 system and so uh, so we'll work on phasing them out and then we need to come up with a, a solid plan on what buildings and how do we transfer our negotiations with the vendors are whether or not it makes more sense for us to all get on board at once with one flat fee or do we break this up and and do and go by building um sections and so so we'll continue working on that but soon that building will be uh ready for reconsideration and we're hoping that diminishes our need for call-ins um in addition to that being sort of the hub there's over 40 miles of copper throughout the city that can be damaged during storms and all those things. Other questions from the council? Great, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to the second uh, workshop item, overview of transportation studies.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, Jonathan Levante, uh, Transportation Systems Director for the City. Um, brief presentation in addition to the, the map and the very busy spreadsheet we provided in, in the packet. Um, I'm going to go over a lot of stuff in a short period of time and try to keep it as high level and then we can have some conversation, answer some questions, and if we need to frame some follow-up um, to get into more detail, um, we can certainly do that. Um, in, the, in the spreadsheet, um, sort of broke ongoing initiatives, so a, a lot of this is packaged around projects that have been initiated or uh, in some ways shifted towards my work with the city since I began. So don't look at that list as exhaustive. Um, there are the regular CIP and, and other projects that emerge from engineering, these sort of stack uh, on top of that. Um, I'm going to start with the design engineering construction block because those are at a stage where there is an engineer working to get to stamp plans so we can build things. Um, and then I'll highlight some of the, the higher level planning and then the scoping of planning from there. Um, so that there are a handful of, of, of projects in queue. Um, the top two are, uh, I would consider, fairly significant safety improvements. Uh, one at the intersection of Turner and Denison Streets, which is a key connector to both Washburn and to the PAL Center. Um, we were able to secure uh, a state grant uh, through the, their bike ped program. Uh, the city had not applied for a grant through that program and I want to say almost 20 years. Um, that's a program we're eligible to apply every year. Once you get a grant for engineering, um, you're guaranteed once the engineering is done for the state to fund uh, construction um, at an 80-20 split. So the goal with a lot of this work is, is to try to bring in non-local money. So when Dan highlighted to all of you, I think the CIP you know, targeting them managing $12 million in projects, that doesn't allow us to stay on top of the current roads that we have as they exist, let alone looking at improvement, safety investments, or otherwise. So a lot of this is really around positioning us for, to find additional funds. Um, we did secure a federal safety grant uh, for the section of Turner Street between Court and Hampshire and Great Falls Plaza, uh, an area where we've had several pedestrian-involved crashes, in particular around the crosswalk entering the Y, um, jurors uh, coming from Great Falls Plaza to the courthouse, uh, sheriff staff making that left-hand turn ac across multiple lanes of traffic. Um, so work is underway for a, a fix, uh, a safety improvement to that section of street. Um, you likely heard about the Riverwalk extension uh, earmark um, that was secured um, with uh, help from the congressional delegation and, and Senator Collins. Uh, that work now quickly pivots to um, the design engineering and moving to construction and we're already having conversation with DOT to make sure that that funding um, is adequate to make the project um, to allow the project to be delivered. DOT is ready to support us in that. Um, both Court Street and Minded Avenue and we'll get into more of this in, in a moment. Um, we've engaged a, an engineering firm to provide updated striping plans. DOT is coming with pavement rehab projects on Court, Court Street or Upper Court Street, Union Street, Goff Street, up through to about Manly Road, uh, and then the Rotary uh, at Washington and mine it through downtown. Uh, DOT expressed a willingness if we wanted to change the striping in those areas, that if we provided stamped plans, uh, they would work with us to integrate those. So it's a chance to make an improvement without the city having to you know, bear the cost of uh, altering the pavement at the same time. Um, the Court Street striping, part of that was a follow-up to public outreach that we completed um, about a year ago. Another portion of that um, was tied to the planning board's approval of the apartments at 555 Court Street, and we can, um, we can talk more about that one in a bit. Um, the Minot Avenue Washington Street Rotary uh, came up during the Court Street um, improvements, I mean the Court Street outreach. Uh, there's more that we'll talk about later about physically changing the rotary. Um, it's sort of a crawl, walk, and run exercise. So if we've got an opportunity to make an incremental safety improvement, we want to do that, recognizing that there needs to be a bigger fix. Um, and another uh, is Washington Street at Brickyard Circle. Um, we worked with DOT as part of last year's paving project. Um, they took up a number of the crossovers. If you know what, what, where north and southbound come together on Washington Street at the northern end, 
Uh, there were a significant number of crossovers that time created driver confusion around where to reverse direction, where to enter or exit um, with uh, EPI's redevelopment of, I think it was 358 Washington Street, they agreed to alter their curb cut. DOT agreed to you know, pick up the pavement in loam and seed over a couple of those crossovers. The last element will be the addition of a left turn lane from Washington Street to allow reverse direction on Brickyard, which will also provide access to the Brickyard Commons uh, apartments. Um, wanted to, before we get into the, the, the planning projects, just kind of walk you through some of the elements that get into how we actually uh, ultimately award bids and, and, move, and move Earth. Um, it's really a multi-step process to get there. Um, the, the scoping, understanding what we're trying to, to build as a community, and, and most of that, if not all of that, is driven by the, the community's land use vision in those areas. Um, is it, uh, is it a, a residential neighborhood? Is it a mixed use area? Is it an area in a downtown? Is it an industrial area? Um, that drives what type of treatment? Because um, ultimately the driver behavior or access in those areas will be driven by that. Um, there are multiple stakeholders that are involved and ultimately if the goal is to get to funding, especially non-local funding, we need to make sure all of those stakeholders are involved at the beginning are buying in and are supportive of the outcome. Uh, that doesn't mean it's, it, there's unanimity um, because any type of infrastructure investment um, brings some change, um, but we need to make sure we can demonstrate their support. So at the local level, as residents, it's elected officials, it's staff, it's investors. Um, at the state level, it's making sure DOT is on board and supportive. Sometimes that means getting them on board early and walking them away from what they would traditionally do towards a new approach. Um, as well as permitting agencies if we're looking at any kind of significant uh, investment or change in infrastructure. Uh, and at the federal level, um, uh, and that relates you know, more directly to the funding sources, um, you know, US DOT or even the Economic Development Administration. Um, there, there are two um, sort of big policy buckets that I guess I, I would relate to you that um, are, the, the council has a, an opportunity to influence on transportation projects. One is the land use vision that's laid out um, community-wide at the neighborhood level. Um, what you envision for the community, the infrastructure will then drive the type of growth that you see. So you create a five-lane highway like Center Street, you're not gonna see that be a walkable neighborhood. Um, but how you manage that could influence quality of life on, on other corridors, as I'm sure many of you know, if it becomes less convenient to travel Center Street, Folks find other ways to get places more efficiently. The other big bucket is how you finance those improvements. Um, do you look at just having the local property taxpayer fund improvements? Do you look at the role of tax increment financing? What role do developers play? Does the city want to carry the cost of offsite improvements for developers? Should the developer carry the entire burden? Do you create a corridor plan and every time a new project comes in, they invest a portion of that? So figuring out what kind of funding mix, that allows ordinances and other pieces to fall out. So any new project that would come forward is following the overall funding strategy. Um, I think that's th those two areas are really key to where we go forward to implement. Um, and I, I don't think that the local property taxpayers alone will be able to carry the kind of projects that we're thinking about. It's going to have to be multiple sources. Uh, on the planning side, there are three efforts underway that are citywide. Um, a big part of these is, is our partnership with the Androscoggin Transportation Resource Center, which is at AVCOG. Um, that's where uh, federal highway planning dollars come into AVCOG, and then we work with Lewiston, Lisbon, and Sabatis on prioritizing use of those funds. Um, one grant that we received in partnership with Lewiston was Safe Streets and Roads for All. Um, we kicked off that process uh, about a month ago, had a workshop meeting with the Complete Streets Committee to talk about public outreach strategies. That's really about trying to understand how do we achieve something called Vision Zero, which is the goal of having no serious injuries and no fatalities on our transportation network, and making sure we engage uh, all users, in particular more vulnerable users. Um, over the last three year period, we had about 3,000 crashes in Auburn, um, and we have about 40 um, high crash locations, which 
are either road segments or intersections where there are more crashes on average there than you would see at other comparable intersections in the state. Um, so we really have an outsized crash problem. Um, and how do we go about tackling that um, with a system-wide approach? Not just how you design the street, it's how you provide traffic enforcement, it's what type of response do you provide with you know, police, fire, and rescue, uh, and so on. Um, there's a traffic signal management study underway to better understand the current state of our system and to help us build a, a multi-level investment strategy. Um, we have, if I had to guess, maybe a quarter of an equivalent uh, of a staff person working on traffic signal management here. Um, that is by far the, the lowest level of, of staffing investment in traffic signal management of the larger cities in the state. Um, Portland, Lewiston, and Bangor probably invest 10 times that in staffing plus capital. That investment has yielded the DOT working with them for significant federal funds to further elevate the management of the system. Um, so the future of our traffic signal system is something that we'll want to talk about um, over time uh, as it directly impacts mobility, in particular on a street like Center Street or Route 4 from Exit 75. Um, maintaining mobility along those corridors is critically important for the adjacent neighborhoods and quality of life there. Uh, and the Metropolitan Transportation Plan is a, it's a 20 to 40 year horizon, really big project. What are we trying to accomplish with the system? And it helps to figure out how we score local funding um, or local allocation of federal highway funding that, that DOT uh, works with us on. Um, two studies that uh, one has kicked off, one will be going out to bid soon. One is for the Washington Street Corridor from about exit 75 to the Rotary. Uh, and I have a slide that I'll, I'll highlight on that. Another is through DOT's Village Partnership Initiative, uh, which will look at Minot Avenue um, through, uh, from Outer Minot Avenue near Hatch Road, through downtown, including Union Street to Center Street, with an added focus on Court Street and the potential to try to manage mobility to shift traffic, improve travel times on Minot Avenue as an alternative to what we see for um, direct cut, call it cut through traffic. In essence, traffic that starts on one end and has no destination um, on the points in between and how we can go about tackling that. Um, here's a nice chart. This is a 1958 <coughs> study um, of traffic into, uh, into Auburn. Uh, and I, I want to highlight this for just a couple of reasons. Um, one, you can see a dark line on the coming from the left side of the screen in. So the turnpike at this point had been open just a couple of years um, through Lewiston Auburn. Um, maybe 30 years prior, Washington Street North had been built. Um, that street never existed before. And, you know, your major routes into town were Hotel Road, uh, Old Danville Road to South Main Street. Um, so Washington Street was a new build as the country emerged with a embracing you know, highways in the automobile. Um, DOT was in construction for the southbound side. So you don't see any traffic assigned to the southbound side because it was about to open, but you can certainly see the crossovers. You see Minot Avenue kind of running from the center down through the, the center of that graphic. And just to the right of that, you can see Court Street. Um, for folks who are longtime community members, you know that Court Street um, brought you directly into Lewiston and Minot Avenue stopped about where Denny's is. There was no union, there was a union street, but it was not a bypass. It didn't connect you um, to what we know now as Route 4. So that traffic looking to move north would hang a right and then come down the hill and hang a left and head out. Um, so a, a lot of what we're dealing with with transportation planning is looking at the sort of the momentum based on how we've built streets in generations before and trying to figure out how do we continue to have mobility while we reshape that. Um, I think a lot of folks would say that what happened with Washington Street North and the neighborhood that was there um, in terms of the, the highway um, emerging that w was never really built um, and the impacts around Court Street as, as some of those played out are all things that we want to try to address over time. So uh, Washington Street, um, the comprehensive plan, this was probably the, the big recommendation in the transportation chapter of the update back in 21 which was to revisit the original Washington Street plan, which was to uh, 
make the southbound side a two-way controlled access highway. So when that was constructed back in the late 1950s, DOT bought 250 feet of right-of-way, which is about the width of, say, the, the turnpikes right away, the amount of land that they had to build the highway, with the, the plan being that they would build the southbound controlled access highway, they would come back later and build the northbound and convert back to two-way traffic what's now Washington Street North. Um, this was the way the state built the interstate. Um, 295 was built this way. You, they built one section. You had Route 1, one direction. Um, you had southbound 295. They built the other section, and they reverted Route 1 to two-way traffic, the northern part of the interstate in Maine, similar. Uh, they never finished this project, so what we're looking to evaluate is the potential to make that southbound side two-way controlled access, which means no curb cuts, no strip malls, no gas stations, no Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so from, you know, whether it's the Rotary South or from around Brickyard South towards exit 75, if you just want to get to downtown Lewis and Auburn or continue north, you wouldn't have to experience what you experience now northbound. What that allows us to do on the northbound as a city is convert back to two-way traffic look at alternative development strategies from a land use perspective. Um, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's one of the, the form-based codes. Maybe it's an alternative to the general business zone. You have a mix there of industrial uses, general business uses, residential uses. Um, but the residential uses are really out of place when you've got 50 to 60 mile an hour traffic while kids are waiting without sidewalks for a school bus. Um, there's about 200 to 300 acres, depending on how you measure it, in that section of Washington North, which is about the size of the ADAPT area, for anyone that followed the downtown planning in Auburn about 25 years ago. And the eastern boundary of that is the Little Androscoggin River, where planning and other community groups have been doing quite a bit around recreation, open space, river restoration. So there is a significant redevelopment opportunity where there's currently a footprint. Um, but that really won't happen with, with the speed and the, the road layout that we have now. So that study, there's a, Coral Palmer's been hired. That study has a kickoff meeting later this month. There will be a public, a significant public engagement and discussion. There'll be city council briefings, and we'll be working closely with DOT, as any conversion like this would, would take not only significant public support, but our, our efforts to seek federal funds. Uh, from a, a, a scoping perspective, um, these are areas where there is interest in doing a study, um, but making sure that we're asking the right questions is essential um, going into uh, such a study. Um, two areas that have been identified, uh, and some of this was in engagement with the, the prior council allocated um, about $300,000 in ARPA funds to, to bring third parties on to assist with Washington Street, with, um, I call it the Mount Auburn neighborhood because Mall area is kind of tired for me. Uh, we can come up with a different name with a marketing firm maybe. And then the downtown. Um, what we've been able to do with Washington Street was get that funded with federal funds. So there wasn't a need to use local dollars. Um, a portion of the downtown will be part of that Minot Avenue, Union Street, Court Street study where DOT will be bringing $100,000 to the table for that study as well. Um, so that leaves the, the Mount Auburn neighborhood, which is the mall area, and Mechanics Row and Main Street north to Great Falls Plaza. And looking at that multi-block area, the state of the street grid, um, opportunities for development of unbuilt space while recognizing the need for mobility through our community, um, access for all users, which is a significant challenge in that area as we you know, got to see firsthand when we had our AARP walking audits um, last fall. Uh, Councilor Walker uh, was able to join in on one of those. Um, you know, folks with mobility challenges can't move through our downtown. Um, folks at the Esplanade don't go to community concerts um, because they can't, from an ADA perspective, get on follow a crosswalk to get to Court Street, let alone to feel safe crossing it. So th those are real barriers in our downtown for folks who live here and how do you balance access for those folks with people wanting to commute to another destination. Um, in terms of projects that are in scoping, one of those 
uh, through conversations with the prior council, with DOT and CSX. Uh, and it's been a longstanding conversation about how can we get to quiet zones or limited horn zones in our downtown. Um, and DOT, CSX, and the Federal Railroad Administration uh, came to town a couple of weeks ago to talk more about how we might implement uh, a quiet zone from about Elbison Street through uh, to the Turner Street Bridge. So in essence, any train traveling um, that might um, send a horn sound to Belinda's home over at the Barker or for any of the residents or businesses in downtown, um, there is a pathway to do that through a, a safety project at Library Ave and Spring Street, um, and we're scoping an evaluation of that. Uh, the state is willing to offer some Federal Railroad money towards that, and CSX is also willing to make an investment. So the goal is to try to accomplish that um, with non-local dollars, and we're further scoping that. Um, the other, uh, which is a mix of um, neighborhood feedback from the Court Street engagement, which is to add crosswalks at Fairview Avenue on Court Street in Millet Drive. Um, but with the approval of uh, 555 Court Street, um, one of the elements that we, we will need to advance is the construction of a shared use path, which sort of a, a supersized sidewalk. So similar to what we have on Park Avenue from Court Street to the elementary school, um, it would be the, the construction of um, a place for cyclists and pedestrians uh, in lieu of widening Court Street. So our, our adopted city plans call for maintaining bike, bike lanes and pedestrian access between Fairview and Park Ave. Um, so if the road is not widened um, to accommodate uh, at least a five foot shoulder uh, and the development of 555 Court would not allow that, the other alternative would be to add a, a shared use path to that section of, of street. Um, I have a couple of quick slides and then I'll be I'll be wrapped up. So in the downtown area, um, you know, this is a, a kind of gives you a sense of uh, at least in that that oval is the area we would be looking at. So really around Drummond Street um, through Court Street and into Great Falls Plaza. Um, there's obviously a lot of surface parking there, some underutilized known pedestrian safety challenges, um, as well as some potentially some opportunities for for redevelopment, so really a, a, a targeted um, evaluation there. Um, and in the area around uh, Mount Auburn, um, a very different area um, with, with residential uses being introduced there, some of the changes to the general business zone that allows for um, more use of properties and the movement away from minimum parking standards for commercial. Um, I know, and Eric could certainly talk more to this in future meetings, there's been a lot of interest in um, seeing development on some of those parking areas um, in and around the mall area. Uh, the transportation system is a, a little haphazard there. Um, you know, Kingsway, for example, there's no efficient connection from Turner to Center Street near, near Target. Um, the Mount Auburn Ave interchange with Center Street is inefficient and is a high crash area. And if you're uh, a pedestrian, if you have any kind of mobility challenge, um, it's just, it's not an area um, that is, is safe or inviting or convenient, uh, let alone when we get into, into winter months. So trying to revisit how that street grid is laid out um, to not only make it safer now, but ideally as, as potential infill occurs. And I'll, uh, there's a lot there. Um, I'm happy to answer questions and certainly Phil, uh, if you have other questions after, I'm happy to organize additional workshops or memos to the council. Questions from the council? Council Whiting. Uh, <clears throat> I see that the uh, city of Portland is rethinking the Franklin arterial. And, I'm, and when I read that, I thought of Union Street Bypass, which is nowhere near as huge a right of way as the Franklin Street arterial. But do you see any potential for? sort of redoing that corridor in the future? I mean, obviously it would take money beyond anything we have. So one of the goals of doing the um, Minot Avenue through Union Street study um, is not only to envision what, what's the community want of that corridor, but to be mindful of the potential funding sources. So when you mentioned Portland, I thought you were going to mention Libby Town, which is the, 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 the if anyone loved going to the Denny's in Portland, or if you ever went to the Denny's in Portland, it no longer exists. The state bought it. 
Um, that area divided a neighborhood to provide for highway access. Um, if you look at the rotary, um, at the rotary in particular, and how it divided the Madison and sort of the presidential streets from the rest of the community, uh, and the challenge of even getting to Edward Little, and you look at the Union Street bypass, which um, really separated now one of our m more challenged neighborhoods from our business district, um, those are really good examples of, of how you can use highways to destroy community fabric. Um, and we want to be mindful of opportunities. So that, depending on what happens with intersections, you know, are there ways to reduce the number of travel lanes if you were to do something like a roundabout? That's one of the benefits of using things other than traffic signals. If you can keep traffic moving, even at a slower speed, you can use some of that land for other things um, and improve pedestrian bicycle access. There's really no safe way. There is a crosswalk there, but I've rarely, and I, I run that route, I, I rarely have vehicles stop when you're in the crosswalk, you're, you're kind of taking your, taking your chance. Um, so I, I, the, the goal is to go after some of those competitive funds because those would be, I mean, just, just the roundabout at Libby Town is a, you know, is a 22, $23 million fix. So it's real money. Other questions by the, from the council? Council Walk. I'm uh, just surprised that there's nothing for Main Street from here to New Auburn in your plan there. Uh, Main Street, we all know it's almost impossible to come out of Mechanics Row and turn on the Main Street if there's a truck coming the other way. And I'm kind of surprised there's nothing to show that we either get rid of parking on one side or we widen it somehow. Uh, I'm just surprised because that's such, such a used section yeah. coming through town. It's uh, it, it makes me think of Court Street many yeah. times. So there, there is in, indirectly. Um, so if you can picture the Minot Avenue corridor sort of runs parallel to Main Street. So trying to understand the, if there is commercial truck traffic on Main Street, is it destined there for a delivery or is that traffic that could be on, uh, on uh, Minot Ave as an alternative? You know, a good example of that, we did some modeling with AVCOG of traffic that, that's north of the Union Street bypass on Center Street and that was destined for New Auburn. And the lion's share of that traffic used Turner Street, crossed Court Street to Mechanics Row to Main Street. So it had no interest being in the core of the downtown, but that was the easiest route. Um, even though the Union Street bypass is there, and Elm Street could be an alternative to not using these city blocks. So that's part of the Minot Avenue study. We'll try to understand are there ways to use that four-lane highway where we don't have to use um, the two the two-lane Main Street. The other bigger challenge long term is that there's no easy way to go east-west in Auburn. Um, so Minot Avenue to the Rotary, High Street, Academy Street into New Auburn, across the Lound Bridge, that sort of serpentine movement um, has to happen because there's no efficient way to move east-west. Uh, the Washington Street study is going to start looking at what might it look like if Rodman Road had some sort of deeper connection and could start making its way east, if you will. Um, we won't get fully into the weeds on that, but the, the comprehensive plan does talk about how, how can we make more efficient connections so that traffic might not have to come through New Auburn and use Main Street if it had a more efficient route. Um, there's really no way to get into that peninsula of New Auburn without go either, well, if you're, if you're a commercial truck, you're, you're just going through right, right through the heart of the city, even if you've got no interest to do that. If you want to go to Freeport, you still have to snake your way through New Auburn. So we're going to model some of that and see what some solutions um, might be. So stay tuned. I'll, I'll make sure um, as information emerges that relates to that, I, I share that. Um, I, I do, I know that there was some questions submitted by um, a resident to some counselors with respect to Court Street. Um, I did want to highlight one element of that and certainly if, if there's other questions on that. Um, the signal timing. So one of the challenges with signal timing is being able to maintain those signals and then coordinate those signals um, with other traffic signals. So for example, if we want traffic that's on Outer Minded Avenue to lose some time trying to come down Court Street, we obviously need to change the signal timing um, 
at court and minded and manly and also at park and court. Right now, that signal equipment is not connected to the city's fiber network, and the equipment is not capable of um, being timed to be coordinated. So you can, set, you can set timing and leave it, but you can't just set it without being able to manage the rest of the network. Uh, we were very specific when we were asked to review the proposed uh, public infrastructure TIF for 555 court. We put in there specifically um, a request for allocations uh, as, as TIF funding would be available to run fiber um, up Court Street to that signal and to be able to have fiber at Minot Avenue as well, um, as well as to be able to upgrade the equipment. Um, there may be other pathways to get to that. Um, just changing the signal timing though wouldn't be sufficient um, because of the need to have places for vehicles to be in queue on Minot Avenue waiting to make that left. Anyone who's traveled that road knows that inbound traffic is green all by itself and then outbound traffic is green all by itself. That would have to be retimed and laid out in such a way as to allow in and outbound to travel at the same time and the turning traffic to you know wait for its own signal. So we, we're mindful of that. Um, We've tried to queue up some potential capital funds through the TIF. Uh, I'm very optimistic that as part of this corridor study, we're going to look at signal timing and prioritize elements of that for, for seeking federal funds as well. Other questions from the council? Um, so just to go back to Court Street for a minute. Um, so the striping plan that um, is has been created at this point by the engineers does that assume that this multi-use path will be created at the same time because that plan removes uh the bike lane from between richardson and dawes all the way up to park f and are those things being done together or is that two separate things right now they are two separate things Okay, so we can go over that in, in more detail, but living in that area, um, e even already this time of year, um, there's bicyclists traveling that section, which will now be in the driving lane in an area that by DOT's own regulations doesn't qualify for a shared lane because even though it's 25 mile an hour zone, it's well above that for the speed and it's not a low use area. So I think there needs to be some more discussion. I, personally, having reviewed that, I don't understand what problem we are solving with putting a center turn lane in. So, yeah, so if, if, I, if I could, um, this is a, I'm confident that the review of 555 Court Street and the associated offsite improvements is, is probably a good test case to understand what type of strategies the city wants to use to fund infrastructure. So as part of the review for 555 Court Street and the amount of turn counts that would be made during the peak hour, um, some of that's engineering jargon into that development, the plan, rev the plan review process at the planning board um, did require um, that that turning lane be added uh, in conversations with DOT they were certainly clear, and again, city plans noted that that is a priority bike route. So minded have Fairview to AMS to Park Avenue, um, ensuring safe, dedicated cycling access was essential, and DOT agreed. Uh, so DOT's recommendation was that if the city's interest with approving that project, this, they agreed that there needed to be a turn lane, but there were two ways to do that. You either build a shared use path or you widen the road. And in that case, the, the developer's responsibility was to make a $38,000 payment towards the restriping, um, but that did shift the, off, the other offsite improvements to the city. Yeah, we can go back and look at that. I have a different recollection of those meetings. My recollection was that the $38,000 was for the crosswalk at Fairview and that the striping plan wasn't actually required by the planning board it was just a discussion that was had amongst the planning board and staff so i think we need to revisit that i think there's a lot of concerns in that neighborhood that we're going to 
uh, lose the uh, bike lanes, um, that putting the center turning lane in that whole length, um, it's like I said, it's hard for me to understand what traffic issue that's solving. And from my background, I can see quite a few traffic issues that that might cause. So um, I think we're going to try to have a public meeting on that coming up in the future, and we can have some more detailed discussion. Um, any other questions by the council? Great. Thank you very much. We'll um, recess here for a couple quick minutes and uh, reconvene for the council meeting. March 18th, Auburn City Council meeting will be called to order. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we can.
can have the uh, counselors introduce themselves, starting with Councilor Geary. Good evening. My name is Belinda Geary. I'm an Auburn City Councilor at large. Good evening. Rick Whiting, uh, Ward 1 City Councilor. Steve Milks, Ward 3 City Councilor. Jeff Hyman, Mayor. Ben Wisner, City Councilor, Ward 4. Leroy Walker, City Councilor, Ward 5. And Tim Cowan, Councilor, Ward 2. Bill Carroll, City Manager. Councilor Platts is not able to join us tonight. He is out of state. <clears throat> We'll start with um, the consent agenda. There's five consent agenda items tonight, all nominations put forth by the uh, Appointments Committee. There's Chris Carson for the Sustainability and Natural Resource Management Board, Steve Buchanan, Gerald Sampson, and Kathy Shaw for the Board of Assessment, and Tina Ugly for the Age-Friendly Community um, Committee. Is there a motion? Motion to move. Second. Move. Moved by Councilor Walker to adopt as printed and seconded by Councilor Geary. The vote will be by show of hands. All in favor? Opposed? Six having voted in the affirmative and none in the negative, the motion is adopted. <clears throat> the next item of business will be the minutes from the March 4th, 2024 regular council meeting. Are there any errors or corrections? Is there a motion? Motion to move. Second. Moved by Councillor Walker to adopt the minutes, seconded by Councillor Whiting. The vote will be by show of hands. All in favor? Opposed? And um, for the public, um, Councillor Mills is abstaining because you were not here at the meeting, correct? So it's uh, five having voted in the affirmative, none in the negative, one abstaining. The motion is adopted. The next item of business will be communications, presentations, and recognitions. The first item that's in the packet is the um, uh, disenfranchised business enterprise plan for federal fiscal year 24, 25, and 26 was submitted by uh, Mr. Labonte. There's no action required by the council. This is a uh, routine plan that's submitted by uh, the airport um, board in order to comply with the federal DBE requirements. Are there any questions at all on this by the council? <clears throat> the next item is a communication on the use of city property for 143 Hampshire Street um, parking area. This is a letter from Salt Lake Community Center regarding uh, a request to put a um, uh, trailer in that area to support their um, their community um, engagement programs. Um, I believe, um, uh, Mr. Manager, this is a still something that's being reviewed by zoning, and there's questions as to whether. Uh, I think the first hurdle is whether this will comply with the zoning requirements in that area. Is that correct? Correct. So currently, uh, staff is not recommending uh, this use for that parking lot. I think that we'll continue to look at some other solutions, uh, but this is really the communication from uh, the individual who's here um, to um, put this before the city council so you know this discussion is taking place, but staff's continuing to navigate and determine what could take place there. Uh, rather than something that's uh, a permanent fixture within the parking lot. And Darlene Conan is here from Salt Lake Community Center. If there's any particular questions um, from the council on this communication. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, the next item is a mayor's communication regarding the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness. Um, <clears throat> just communicating to the council and the public that the charge of the committee is to assess the current state of homelessness in Auburn, provide advice and recommendations to the city council to address the homeless issue by identifying the role of city government, identifying organizations the city can partner with, and identifying a strategy and priority activities to be undertaken. There is a um, uh, com committee membership. Um, Councillor Cowan and Councillor Geary are on the uh, committee. Councillor Cowan is one of the co-chairs. 
Jen Edwards from the Public Health Department, Sasha Anastasaw from the School Department, uh, George Sheets representing veterans and clergy, Bill Lowenstein who has addiction treatment background, Elizabeth Fowler who is a public health uh, social worker, Leslie Torkelson who works in workforce peer navigation, David Billadu, who's also one of the co-chairs who uh, works with the uh, uh, mental health response and with the P PSY team, Marianne Veu, who represents the uh, Salt Lake Community Center, Peter Floyd representing the um, Pleasant <coughs> Street Drop-In Center, and two community members, Bonnie Hayes and Bruce Nodden. The um, committee's um, Schedule is posted on the website. They had their first meeting last week, and I understand they'll be meeting every two weeks in the near future. Is that correct? That is correct. We're still looking for the location, but we'll <laughs> check the website. We'll move on to the first open session of the night. Any member of the public uh, that would like to address the council on any issue related to city business, but not on tonight's agenda, please approach the podium. Um, provide your name and address and your comments to the council. Not seeing any, we'll close the um, first open session and move on to unfinished business. The first item is Ordinance 07-0304-2024, removing Appendix A from Auburn's Code of Ordinances. This is a second reading. The, to refresh the council's memory, um, we dealt with this at the last meeting. We're removing Appendix A from the ordinate itself to be an attachment so that changes to the, the um, fee schedule in Appendix A don't require the uh, two readings and a public hearing uh, that Appendix A currently requires and would just require a council order. Is there a motion? Motion to move. Second. Moved, by, moved by Councillor Walker to um, adopt as written and seconded by Councillor Wisner. Is there any discussion from the council? Any public comment on this item? Anyone who makes, would like to make a comment, please approach the podium, provide your name and address and your comments to the council. Council ready for the question? <clears throat> the vote will be by roll call. The clerk will call the roll. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Whiting? Yes. Councillor Catwin? Yes. Councillor Miltz? Yes. And Councillor Weisner? Yes. Six having voted in the affirmative and none in the negative, the motion's adopted. Is there any other unfinished business to come before the council? We'll move on to new business. The first agenda item is order 390318. 2024. So the disposition of building located at 46 Fair Street under the dangerous building statute. It will be a public hearing with the parties with an interest in the property. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, here tonight to uh, present information on the building at 46 Fair Street. Um, to my right is Jennifer Dick, uh, Code Compliance Officer, and Mark Bauer, uh, City Attorney. So Mark will give an overview of process, um, and Jennifer uh, will talk about the conditions at the building. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Mark Bauer. I'm an attorney at Jensen Baird. Um, and I'm here tonight to provide general guidance for the council as they work through this process, the public hearing process, um, and potentially a decision-making process. I did want to provide a, a brief overview. I understand that you have had sort of the overview of the dangerous building process fairly recently, so I won't you know, go into great detail about the various steps to, um, if you've already got that covered. But if any questions come up during the process, please uh, let me know and I'll, and I'll respond to them. 
I did want to provide sort of the procedural overview that uh, is, is some of it's in your packet, um, um, the exhibit one, I think, of uh, if you've gone through it, um, is a memorandum from uh, from my law firm on sort of the title title issues um, for the real estate title. Uh, we did a search to make sure that we've captured all of the people who need to be notified of the dangerous building proceeding tonight. Uh, the statute requires both obviously the owner of the building and any uh, what are called parties in interest um, and according to this to the statute and that would include anyone who has a mortgage on the property anyone who has a lien interest on the property and so forth obviously any any mortgage holder would have interest in the collateral um, that's that's the collateral for their loan uh, so we want to identify all those there were the owner um, uh, Red Coral Investments LLC, and then there were four parties in interest that needed to be uh, notified of tonight's uh, proceeding, and that was uh, FNF Ventures LLC, um, 32 Ventures LLC, uh, the Auburn Water District, the Auburn Sewer District, and then um, not needing a notice, but but a lien holder is also the City of Auburn. And so all of those parties have been served by a sheriff with tonight's public uh, hearing notice uh, so that they're aware of the proceeding tonight and can be here if they want to be heard on the, on the issue of whether this building at 46 Fair Street is a dangerous building or not. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the deeds and things and, uh, and liens are in the, in the record for, uh, for the council's reference and also for the, for the record of this, of this proceeding. Um, you know, so without going, you know, too, too far into the, the rest of the, the procedure, um, if there are any questions about, uh, about process, um, please let me know. I'm glad to, re to respond to them. Otherwise, I'm, I, I also, you know, sort of, uh, towards the end of your packet, there is a, an order, proposed order and findings on the question um, for your consideration that I, uh, prepared um, in advance of, of tonight's meeting. Uh, obviously, um, they're just a, a draft, they're just proposed, um, and they can be uh, uh, modified at the council's, uh, at the council's preference. So uh, with that, I will I'll turn it over to Eric to do a, um, uh, an overview of the, of the property. And Thank you. Just a, a quick update and overview. We have worked um, for a long time to try to convince the property owner, Red Coral Investments LLC, um, to maintain the building in a secure way um, and to make improvements. Um, we do have two marks. Wright is um, representative from Red Coral, uh, Zahid Abid. Um, Zahid came to our office last week. Um, after a long period of time where we weren't really able to reach them or, um, or encourage changes at the property. Um, and he would really like the opportunity to save the building. Um, so uh, we're here. Uh, tonight you have an order in front of you that uses demolition as the remedy. Um, we've worked with Zahid for a long time to try to see this building saved. Um, its location is uh, across from the East Auburn Elementary School. Um, it's across the Lake Auburn Outlet from uh, Lake Grove Park. Um, it's right in between those two facilities where we have a lot of children uh, walking in the neighborhood, which has been a major concern um, as far as the safety hazard that this represents. Um, but recognizing that uh, we do have a housing shortage, um, this is a um, an older home in a great neighborhood. Um, it certainly could be saved um, with the right attention and investment. Um, we'll ask you tonight to go through the process. As Mark said, we've done the public notice. Um, and then after hearing um, what Zahid has to say about his plans, and you have a, uh, a plan that was given to us uh, moments ago uh, before the meeting um, that includes uh, some of the things that we asked Zahid for, if there was to be any consideration of a plan other than demolition, if the council does find it dangerous. Um, he did include a check uh, for back taxes, a check for Auburn Water and Sewer, although it looks like the amounts are imposed. So the amount for the Auburn Water District should have been to the city of Auburn and vice versa. Um, 
he's indicated that he'll correct that tomorrow. Um, but uh, after you hear about the building, uh, you have the draft findings. Uh, we may ask if you can delay your decision while we work out some of these details uh, to see if there is a possibility of rehabbing the building over the next couple weeks. Um, with that, uh, Jennifer's here to go through her findings as a code officer for the City of Barber. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I don't want to sit up here and recite everything that you've already read throughout your packet. I do want to say that um, my first interaction with Zahid was um, over a year and a half ago. I have worked diligently to try to get him to secure this building on a continuous basis due to its proximity to the school and the park. I believe that sitting behind me are neighbors who surround this um, 46 Fair Street who would like an opportunity to speak this evening as well. Um, I receive concerns from Auburn residents on a regular basis about this property and its proximity to the school and the park and their concerns. Up until last Friday, this property had power and um, as you can see from the pictures that I presented, the property was left unsecured and wide open. I think it's important that we talk about the tragedy that was avoided because in Auburn, we like to be proactive instead of reactive. So the fact that any number of children could have walked into this building on any single day at any single time of the day and stuck their finger in any of these electrical components that were live is a great concern to me. And I repeatedly contacted Zahid by phone, by letters. None of the letters were ever returned. I think it's important to say that. Um, to my knowledge, he's a resident of Las Vegas. That's where I was told to send all of the letters. That's where his business is located. Um, so I just feel like it's really important that we discuss responsible construction if he is in fact given the opportunity to save this building and that it will be properly secured at all times because just because a tragedy didn't happen, I think it's important that we understand that it could happen. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask me. Again, I don't want to sit here and go page by page and waste any of your time. Go ahead, Councilor Geary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you please put the pictures on the screen of what we had to see as in code violations? That may help some counselors and the public to realize what we're working with. There's an extensive history of notices of violation uh, from our office, including citations one through, I believe, five. So I'll go to those and the um, the pictures if I can get through these deeds. We also performed two um, very important inspections that have great photos as well. <coughs> and the city has secured it um, at least two times during that period only to find that it's left unsecured again after that um, either by somebody who broke into the building or by um, workers at the building doing some basic work on the structure. If we look to the screen, you can see um, this was the beginning photos of my violations. Um, you can see how unsecure the property is. Um, a deck started to be built on the back, um, just presenting lots and lots of hazards. And that deck is um, basically on the edge of Lake Auburn. Um, it's not something that can be permitted. It needs to be removed as part of the fix here. As you can see from these photographs, the building was left wide open. And um, once we get to the inspections, you'll be able to see the inside of the building. I do apologize for the quality of the photographs um, in the citations. We were having problems with our printer downstairs. It's since been replaced. Uh, this was December 8th of 22, when the notice was sent with those photos. And we do have higher quality images that are not part of a notice of violation that was printed and scanned coming up. There we go. Here we go. So this was from our first inspection. That was um, last May 2023. So this is 
this is, you know, within 250 feet of East Auburn Community School. So a child could walk right in there. There's actually, when we get to the last photograph, the aerial view, you can see that there's actually a footpath from this property to the East Auburn Community School. These, um, sorry, the electrical components just, just hanging. And you can see that it's structurally unstable. Again, this was over a year ago. And this, you'll see in a later picture, is actually in worse condition now than it was then. And you can see that, you know, there's construction debris and everything that's going right into the water. As we continue to move through the citation, and um, we had sent Saheed a uh, printout from our public works department asking him to please pay the amount that it cost us to secure the building. There then was a stop work order um, because we found folks in there doing plumbing and electrical which we didn't have permits for so we asked them to please stop work and that's what the site looked like at that time. That was last July. This was this past winter. So again, unsecured in January of 2024, January 14. I just commend the school teachers and the parents in this neighborhood for keeping the children out of this building. And also, how fortunate are we that no homeless folks found their way into this building and could have either been hurt, harmed, or even worse, there could have been a, a fire with tragedy. Here you can see the proximity to the lake again and Lake Grove Park being right across the, the open water. This was just two weeks ago. So March 5th, um, the back section of the building is open to the elements, water and the light fixtures. Um, this dark liquid is water that's run through the ceiling, through the roof and into the fixtures. Um, on that day, the power was still on. Again, I say to you, how fortunate are we that a child didn't find their way into this building? Power was still on at that time. We believe it's been shut off as of uh, over the weekend after Friday. Charlie DeAngelis, our electrical inspector, asked CMP to please remove the meter. And in speaking with Zahid, um, he did not know, he said, that the power was on at the building. He hasn't been receiving a bill, um, so that was a hazard that existed. Uh, during that time. This is looking out of the second floor on a balcony deck um, in what was probably a bedroom at one time and you can see the playground equipment at Lake Grove Park. Here's our aerial view. I just, um, there's not a picture of Lake Grove Park, but there's the house, there's where Lake Grove Park is, and then you can see the crosswalk that leads from this property right to East Auburn Community School. Are there any questions of Jennifer about specific conditions at the property? Questions from the council? Does the uh, property owner want to address the council? Hello, uh, good evening. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about what kind of happened. Um, so I originally bought this property maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago, and uh, we we're on schedule to finish fairly quickly. And then um, there were some issues with the contractors and they basically took $115,000 um, from renovations, and that's kind of when the project kind of dragged on. I tried to maintain the property and try to keep the project going. Had the same issues with the contractors over and over again. Um, and then eventually, like I said, the building just basically got, um, for lack of a better term, just kind of stalled there. Um, I talked to Eric last week. Um, I've got a pretty good handle of the situation now, and. I believe I have a pretty good plan to take take this property and fix it up. Um, I do do this full time. I have multiple projects going on, and um, over the years, we developed multiple relationships with different contractors um, and licensed professionals to resolve this issue. Um, so I know that um, I submitted the documents a little bit earlier, but I can talk a little bit about the 
timeline and the plan to restore the property, um, if that's okay. Uh, so last week I met with um, I met with landscapers, I met with electricians, I met with plumbers, and I got quotes to uh, resolve most of the issues. Obviously, number one being the security of the building. Um, when I went there last, the building was secured. I mean, there's a couple of windows left open, but uh, the plan is to uh, secure the exterior of the premises, lock all the windows, put no trespassing signs uh, around the property so nobody comes in and out. Um, after that, obviously, all the electrical it needs to be redone. Um, I was not aware there was power at the building. The building has been vacant for at least a year and a half, I understand. I've not ever heard of any bill being sent or paid on my behalf. Uh, when I was there last week, the power was still on. The CMP did call me, said they're going to take out the meter, but I did not see anything um, on my end. Um, so again, we have you know, we have a budget of 60 grand to finish the project. That includes electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and carpentry work needed, as well as the landscaping. Uh, the timeline for the projects of, um, you know, we're starting on Wednesday with the demo guys being there in the dumpsters to replace and secure the premises outside, um, and then ending on uh, June 1st. The biggest timeline is the uh, electrical and plumbing schedule, and they can't start till the middle of next month. Um, but in terms of the st structure of the building, I don't believe it's, um, I don't believe the building is leaning or um, structurally not salvageable. Um, there was a barn that was on the property that was removed, which was causing the building to lean previously, but I don't believe the building is not salvageable or not um, in a position where it needs to be demoed. Obviously, it's a great area. Um, I'd like to get the opportunity to uh, you know, take the next you know month or so to you know remedy the solutions, and you know hopefully work with Eric and such to get the property to where it needs to be. Thank you. Are the members of the public that would like to comment on this particular agenda item, please approach the podium and provide your name and address. I'm Paul Farnsworth. I live at 208 Oak Hill up the hill from the house. Um, the assessment of the property is correct that it's been unsafe for quite some time. It's been open to the elements ever since it was last vacated. Uh, the second floor window on the east facing side has never been closed. Uh, there was a time where there were no windows in the building. Uh, again, exposed the elements. Um, I never did investigate the foundation, but that is looks pretty serious. It's on a very wet site. I wouldn't doubt that the foundation uh, well is currently underwater. Um, but yeah, it's a safety hazard. And it's horrible. The uh, landscaping area, uh, abandoned materials, boards with nails, um, plumbing pieces, it's all sitting out in the yard. Uh, there's piles of pallets and other construction debris. Um, at one point, there was, un there was a pile of trash in the yard from the previous residence. There were diapers. It was pretty gross. Um, a bunch of us in the neighborhood went about and cleaned it up because there were maggots in it. Um, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, I would say if he's willing to go ahead and do improvements, that would be great. But I wouldn't wait too long. Um, it's got to happen. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public that would like to address the council? Please approach the podium, provide your name and address. How you doing? I'm uh, Marty Doherty. I live at 194 Oak Hill, right up the hill. Um, I was very excited when somebody took this project on because it's a beautiful property right by the water. Um, but in my opinion, it's just dragged on and on and on in unsafe ways. And unfortunately, it sounds like he's literally underwater um, and uh, in, with the foundation and also financially as well. When you say that $60,000 over the course of two months is going to correct the problem, I find that very unlikely. Uh, hiring multiple contractors to move that fast is going to be a lot more than $60,000, I would imagine. Um, and I'm also skeptical about what you're going to pull out of it if it does get renovated whether you're going to be an absentee landlord or whether you're going to sell it 
um, you know, for what you can get for it. I mean, I, I, of course, you, you have every right to do that, but I'm mostly concerned with absentee landlordism. It seems like this is an absentee situation. We live there every day. I don't even know where these, I'm going to look them up later on, but a quick look for Red Coral Investments brought nothing on my phone back there. Um, so I don't know who these people are, but I know that my neighbors are very concerned and I know who they are and I know who you guys are. So um, I really think that the idea of renovating would be a great one, but I just don't trust it. And uh, I would recommend demolition. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public that would like to address the council? I'm Janice Conant, 199 Oak Hill Road. Um, we, I took a ride by there to walk by there today. There's still trash everywhere, it's piled high like this, broken glass everywhere, it's building debris, shingles. Like he was here at the city building, but he could have gone to that place many months ago and cleaned that mess up. The front yard is just awful. The backyard is too. There's debris and nails sticking out of things. It's not even a concern about the house inside. It's the outside. That could have been easily cleaned up months ago. Now when it comes down to we're talking about deterioration and tearing it down, now all of a sudden he's interested in it. It's like he took the time to come here and talk about it, but he didn't take the time to go there and pick up the mess all over that yard. It's been like that for years now. I, I, we're going to wait until some kid walks across that yard and gets a nail stuck in their foot or gets cut with a glass. I mean, it's all over that. The inside of the place is gutted. The outside looks horrible. It is we're between two playgrounds. And this man had all this time to fix this. I mean, if you run out of money, he could have come down and, and cleaned up the front yard. If, one of our homeowners had that happen. They would clean up their yard. They would clean up so there wouldn't be any hazard on the outside. This hazard on the outside of that house. And you're talking about a path right from the school right over to there. It's lucky that no kid has gotten hurt on the outside of the place. Never mind the inside. They don't have to try to break into the house. They could be walking across that yard. He's had all this time to clean it up and gone months and months and months and years and years and years and left it. Just left it right there. Whatever the construction workers did, that was their thing. But he could have remedied it. He could have come and cleaned that up, and got a dumpster and picked it up, or hired somebody to come do it. No, he waits until now, until we've been sitting here with it, where it's been a hazard this whole time. Thank you. Other members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion from the council? Motion to move. Councilor Walker has moved adoption. Second. Seconded by uh, Councilor Melt. Discussion by the council. Councilor Geary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Cousins, if, if, if this house gets torn down, can another one, because of its proximity to the water, be rebuilt? Yes, I believe it could. It wouldn't be built in the same footprint. It would be built further away from the lake. Um, but I think you could potentially put a house up closer to the road on this site connected to city sewer um, in the future if it is torn down. Um, is there any chance that any sort of contaminants from the property in this position has gotten into the ground around it and the groundwater in this location? I, I don't know of any contaminants that would be in the groundwater. We do know that there are building materials, though, that are on the edge of the water, and likely some have made their way into the water, pieces of, of vinyl siding or other debris that's, that's blown around out there. Has any of the debris that could hypothetically got into the water uh, did damage another locations that from it floating downstream or down past there? I'm, I'm really not sure if anything would have floated over the dam or if it would have sunk to the bottom. I know there's a canoe and some vinyl siding that's in the water um, on the back side of the property as well as some demo debris, woody debris, um, nails, shingles, that kind of stuff on the shoreline. Uh, 
Other questions from the council? Council Whiting. I'd like to ask Councilor Bauer, uh, would there, would it be feasible for the <clears throat> city council to require the uh, property owner to post a bond related to this? Yeah, I think if, if, if the council were inclined to, um, you know, look at the, the option of restoring the building, uh, one thing that you could require as part of the plan is not only to show financial and technical, or, or not only technical capability, but also financial. Uh, and you, you know, you could you could require you know that uh, showing of a letter of credit or something like that, so that you know that I mean, you, I think in the packet there is some showing of what a, what the average balance in the account has been, but there's no guarantee that that will be in there. You know, tomorrow. You know. Uh, that's the problem with that. Whereas a letter of credit is 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 a assurance from a bank that there's there's money in the bank for a certain period of time. It can be released after a certain period. It can be released in stages. You know, after certain things are completed, you know, certain uh, amount of that letter of credit can be released and so forth. So that would that would certainly be an option uh, to the council. I think that would if if you're inclined to go in that direction. It would probably make some sense to 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 give staffs a you know a, a bit of time maybe until the next meeting to try to come up with a plan um, and bring it back to the council for uh, for for approval or for consideration. That was my <clears throat> concern is just the adequacy of the um, the amount because <clears throat> I don't I mean having rehabbed a house thirty years ago uh, for more than that. <clears throat> And a smaller property, um, the numbers just aren't credible to me. So I would want city staff to, you know, through probably the the uh, building inspector and and other staff to determine what's a a reasonable cost per square foot. And from what your response is, Councillor, it, it sounds to me it's very similar to like a planning board, <clears throat> you know, requiring proof of financial capacity in order to you know, do a project, similar sort of reasoning. Yeah, and, and also keep in mind that what we're talking about is is what amount of money it's going to take to put it into a, a for lack of a better term, non-dangerous condition. You know, I think that we're, I don't think we're talking about uh, necessarily that amount of money to finish the project, you know, drywall and all that stuff. I think, it, unless I'm mistaken, I think it's, it, the, the items are, uh, well, I guess the, there are you know, there are some items that are, that are sort of more interior. I haven't I literally got it five minutes before the meeting, so I haven't really uh, dug into it. But um, you know, I think it, from the council's perspective, the, the concern should be you know getting it into a safe and secure situation, debris removed, that kind of thing, um, and that's that's more of the public safety concern that the dangerous building statute is 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 geared towards. Yeah. Mr. Cousins, a uh, question that I have is if the council votes to uh, tear down the building, um, how long would that take to, to happen? So it, it depends on the time that you gave. Uh, we have to give them a chance to remedy it by tearing down the building if that's the remedy that the council um, orders. 30 days is pretty typical. I think Mark may be able to speak to, to other time frames, but 30 is pretty typical and then if he fails to do that, um, then the city would have to go through a bid process to have it torn down and then lien the property. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. It, it, it can, I've seen as little as 30 and as, you know, as much as 90 days. And then another municipality um, where we do work, I recently advised their board to, and it was, they, they decided they wanted to do 90 days to give a little bit more time because of, you know, weather, uh, you know, it was, it was in January that they had their hearing. So, it's it's really within the discretion of the council to decide you know length of time. Keep in mind that it wouldn't be less than thirty days because um, there's a thirty day appeal period um, for if if the council were to uh, you know, find that it's dangerous and issue a, a demolition order, there would be a thirty day period to appeal that. So you obviously wouldn't want to demo the building or require a demo before that period expired. So I would say run run the gamut from thirty to ninety days. Um, and that's an option for the council too, is to have, you know, some flexibility in the timing. You know, to I think he, he's essentially uh, representing a 90-day period for the work. So, 
Thank you. Um, Kyle. Well, I had, a, I had another right, question. Because I, I also see that, because my concern is, uh, obviously, the, the exterior dangerous to, to the safety of the residents around it. Um, I do see that the, the, the owner has the, that the start date for cleaning up is, on the, is uh, a couple days away. Is, is that being confirmed? That depending on what we do, they're going to be, regardless of what they're, they're going to be coming in a couple of days to do that. Has it yeah. been confirmed? Yes, correct. So I talked to the, um, the dumpster company. The earliest they had delivery was on Wednesday. So there's two dumpsters coming on Wednesday. Then the quote I submitted for the landscaping company, they said it's going to take three to four days to get everything cleaned up and removed from the exterior. And, and they're going to begin on the, on the 20th? Correct. Yes. And, you know, I'm willing to, you know, do on a weekly checkup and by weekly checkup, whatever you guys need to show that I'm making progress on the property. But yes, that was confirmed. And I talked to him last Friday and again early this morning as well. Council Thank you. Colin. Uh, Jennifer, I had a question for you. Excuse me. I, and I think this is just to help me understand better. Uh, the owner, you expressed that you didn't you weren't aware the electricity was on. I thought that I read in, in the multiple citations that there was indication or communication that that was a concern, or am I misunderstanding that? At no point did I say that the electricity was on, but I did express that the, um, that the building was unsecure multiple times. And, and my greatest concern is since November 2nd of 2022, why hasn't Mr. Abid just reach an, uh, reached out to me just so we could have one single conversation? Again, none of the letters were ever returned. So he has received all of these correspondence for the last year and a half. <coughs> Just a, a follow-up comment, uh, if I may. I, um, that's a concern I have. Uh, you know, looking quickly over or over your plan. Um, uh, respectfully, I, I haven't seen a pattern of behavior that shows to me that there's been an attempt to correct uh, and respond. Um, simply, you know, even there have been multiple times. Uh, multiple citations, multiple sets of photos that show different piles of debris that you clearly should have understood. Uh, it was pretty clear that that was a concern um, to, and it shouldn't have happened again. Uh, another example was there was a citation in the, the most recent citation was <coughs> September of 2023. Uh, one thing that was specifically stated there is to remove the, the beginning of a deck, which was literally just two by fours, and it was still there six months later. Yeah, again, I, like I said, I talked to Eric, and I take responsibility for that stuff. Um, I can touch on the deck situation. When I submitted the permit initially, there was a barn on the property, and on the designs the architect submitted, there was a deck that was there. That design was approved by the city, it was, and, and it was went up to the state because it was next to the water. Those designs for the deck were approved. I was just found out last week when I talked to Eric, he said that deck is not permitted, which again was not my understanding because those designs were approved initially um, just last year. Um, again, regarding the cleanup of the property, again, I take federal responsibility for it. There's no excuses um, and I'm willing to you know, move forward and take care of the situation. Council Mill. Yeah. <clears throat> so if I'm looking at the pictures there was some work there's been work done on the house over the last and you've owned it for a year and a half is that correct I think I've owned it for about two years now again originally when we bought the house um, the previous owner there was tenants in there the place was a complete mess uh, we went there gutted the place we replaced most of the windows and you know when we came to the siding and the roof like the roof is all brand new the siding is basically complete besides the deck section the people that were supposed to do the interior of the work they didn't honor their contract they took the money, they ran away. I tried to get a lawyer. They said you couldn't do anything. Um, and if you want to go to court, you can, but there's nothing coming out of it. So, you know, after that situation, the place just kind of sat and sat and sat. And, you know, that's kind of where we are now. Again, I've done multiple projects. I manage a lot of these projects. This has just been neglected. And, um, again. So, if we were to move if I, I understand correctly, if we were to move forward with the order to destroy the building, you, he's, 
the owner still has the ability between now and whenever it happens to continue doing what he owns the building and he can clean it, renovate, do whatever he wants on that property. Is that correct what you said? Am I correctly assessing what you said, Mr. Council? It, it, it is still his property and, you know, uh, and it will remain his property even if the building were removed. But I, I don't know what incentive an owner would have to put money into a building if he knows it's going to be demolished. There's an appeals process, right? There is an appeal process if he wanted to take it. Um, but perhaps the, the, you know, another option would be to um, to come up with a plan with the definitive benchmarks and, and milestones, very short term, um, that would, if, if they're not met, then, that, then, you know, then, that, then it, would, it would lead to demolition, that kind of thing. Um, but that would require a little bit of, I think, work on the part of staff to sort of come up with a proposal to the council, maybe uh, by the next meeting, perhaps, Eric. Do we know who the contractor was that took off? I've been told who it was, yeah. So that you're comfortable with that, with that situation? So I think we would be um, better off having a defined plan with benchmarks than say ordering it demolished in 90 days and then at 30 or 60 we see no progress. Um, I think we'd be much, much better off with defined benchmarks. Um, we were just given this information that you were handed tonight moments before the meeting and there are missing pieces. I think it's a step in a direction that has some of the information we would need to be a good plan, but the financial um, capability would need to be stronger. Um, I think the estimates are low. Uh, we could work through that between now and April 1st if you wanted to. Is and there a, any, in your professional opinion, <clears throat> is the foundation salvageable? Is the frame of the building salvageable? Is, you, I don't want to, say let's give them a chance and with the concerns i um, fairness i haven't been there and i haven't seen the building and i'm not a foundations expert but i know that with all that water i can only imagine what's going on inside the building is there an assessment that we can have an independent or in your professional opinion is that building salvageable we can look closely at that in walking through i mean i'm not an engineer either um, foundations can be tricky especially with water involved i think that there's a back portion of the building that is not sound um, we could ask for an assessment of the front portion as part of a plan um, and do a walk through and see if we can have enough information to evaluate that uh, between now and, and april 1st but um, i believe that some of the building is salvageable um, but we've had a pattern of not acting responsibly to fix it and make it safe. Um, that's part of what we're trying to trying to overcome. Other other questions from the council? Council Walker. Yes, thank you, Eric. Uh, we we've been looking at this building for all of two years for sure. The junk has been out there for all of that time. It's been a dangerous situation. I have brought it up many times to our manager that we're looking across from a beautiful park that we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to make it look nice for the neighborhood, and then we've got to look at that dump that's sitting there. So my opinion is he had all the time in the world to get here, to at least talk to you, clean up the mess. He chose not to do that. So in my opinion, the building should come down. If he wants to build a new one after, go ahead and do it. But I'm sure the foundation is probably about as good as what you're looking at when you look at the building. Other questions, comments from the council? So Mr. Mr. Cousins, there's currently no building permits there, correct? There, there is a building permit for part of the renovation. Um, he included a copy of that, and I think we may have in the packet as well. Is that currently um, valid? The 9-11-2023 one is still valid, but it has limitations on it. Still. It's Exhibit 16 in your packet. And it, it does explain that the rear deck that was being constructed at that time must be removed and cannot be rebuilt. The proximity to the water is the problem with that. Um, I would just like to point out, if you're open, we do have Chief Chase here from the fire department as well. Um, and he was prepared to talk about the type of hazard that a building like this represents, if you're, you're willing to hear it. Yeah, thank you. So um, my thoughts on this are similar to Councilor Walker's, I don't see anything 
in this record that would lead anybody to believe that any work's going to occur. There's been notice after notice after notice by the city and there's been no response. So here we are with this uh, demolition uh, order in front of us and okay, we're at the 11th hour, but uh, I'm certainly not comfortable with thinking that if we just kick the can down the road further that miraculously things are gonna start happening. Um, it, you know, my recommendation would be at the most to postpone this to the next regular meeting and have the property owner come forward to the city. I, I, I appreciate Mr. Bauer's thoughts here, but I don't think it, the city staff ought to be taking their time to pull this thing out of the fire. I think at the most, if, if the property owner wants to do something, let's kick this down to the next meeting, postpone it for two weeks, have him come forward with a detailed plan that addresses uh, a realistic schedule with a realistic budget with some type of letter of credit that or uh, bond satisfactory to the city and um, other than that I agree with Council Walker we should just move forward tonight other comments or questions by the council Council Walker yeah I I would agree with you but I want to see the house totally finished not just boarded up and the outside cleaned up I think it has to be ready to live in, or I don't agree with it. Council Wyden. Yeah, I would, I would like to see, as it's been expressed by the uh, citizens that have come here today about it, is that, yeah, there is a plan to at least clean it up, and I would like to see that done, because it's immediate concern, no matter what. He has a date for two days that they're gonna be there and doing something, I would like to see that done immediately because of the concern to children across the street going to i'd like to see that done if it's going to be scheduled within two days at the very least to have that put somewhere with this whether we're going to postpone postpone it that that should be done no matter what to at least have that and then we can address i think that should be one of the stipulations because if that's not done that's a major concern to me that this is not going to move forward council gary thank you mr mayor i agree pretty much with count with Councilor Wisner that a first step should be to clean it up, whether the, we authorize it has to come down or not. If he chooses, if we say you gotta tear it down, it won't be, well one, it'll be less that he has to move, and two, uh, uh, we were told that he could build a little further away from the water, so we're not saying he cannot have a place there. We're just saying we want it to be as safe as possible. And also, I would like to hear what the, our Chief Chase has to say on this. I mean, maybe not, well, I don't know, if you'd like to listen tonight or at the next meeting. Thank you. Other comments by the council? Council council. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I would support, I would, I would welcome uh, Chief Chase coming in and talking. There was a statement uh, in the, in the um, packet that was presented, and I think concerns should be heard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, in general, when we look at uh, fire hazard as it's associated with dangerous buildings, we look at uh, possible sources of ignition, uh, the fuel load that's there, and the opportunity that we would have to uh, safely, safe, safely, with regard to our personnel, extinguish that fire. Uh, there aren't any necessarily immediate threats of exposures. That's another thing we often look at when we look at dangerous buildings. Is there another building in close proximity that could succumb to a fire, should there be one? Uh, and with regard to this property and um, Ignition sources, certainly the fact that um, it was ill-maintained, the electrical was in poor condition, and it remained energized for all of that time, certainly uh, we've dodged a bullet, if you will, uh, and the opportunity for there to be a fire there. Um, but in, in vacant buildings, and particularly buildings that fall into disrepair and are neglected, um, become magnets for um, vandalism uh, and, you know, and, and um, illegal entry. And that often leads to 
uh, things. We, we respond to a number of fires in which people have gone in to get any value out of the home they can, stealing copper and other things like that. Um, but that also leads to some extent with, um, especially in a neighborhood with a lot of kids, um, you know, uh, kids are a source of ignition, if you will. Um, they're mischievous. Uh, there's certainly sufficient fuel load there to cause a problem. With regard to the, the uh, pictures and the inspections that were done, uh, a, a fire in that building would be A, dangerous for us to fight, but would also be virtually uncontrollable. Um, building structures themselves um, aid us in containing fires as, when, they, when they start. Um, when building structures are intact, um, items like sheetrock are in place, uh, the fire doesn't immediately get the structural members, it doesn't have the ability to move unabated through the building uh, and promulgate very fast. And then lastly, as we look at um, fighting a, build, a fire in a building like that, um, we certainly would have um, concerns about how it could have started, so we may be thinking about trying to get in there and do a search. And operating even in, on that property with the hazards that are there, the debris, the fuel loads, um, the trip hazards and all of those things um, would be problematic for us and, and put us at risk. So with regard to, now, you know, I think that you're having the appropriate discussion about the ability to mitigate those issues, but as the building stands now, those are our concerns, and I certainly would consider it a fire hazard. Any questions for the chief? Council Geary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You hit upon a topic that's in my mind. With all the debris, all the nails, all this, all that, if it's nighttime and your firemen have to go in there, they're putting their lives at risk. I think there's certainly increased risk to us fighting a fire um, in, in a building of that state and on grounds of that state as opposed to um, the risks, uh, you know, in a normal, well-kept, maintained home. Absolutely. Um, both trip hazards. Some of that's just overgrowth and vegetation, but some of it's construction debris. It's piles of debris um, that cause additional fuel loads and those concerns, yes. And then the other thing is if anybody gets in like a small or child or a teenager or something, I mean, I'd, I just don't want anybody to get hurt, maimed, or get killed in this. And I want to look out for anybody, anyone, and our, our police and firemen. Nor do we. We don't want anybody to be hurt either. One of the biggest challenges we have in the fire service, particularly as we look at fires in vacant buildings, um, is trying to understand if we want to take the risk of conducting a search in that building. It's known to be vacant, but you don't know who's in there. The fire started for a reason. Um, you don't often vacant buildings have, um, you know, into, you, you can expect a home that's been occupied to have secure floors and, and no holes and, and those types of things. You don't know in vacant buildings, so there's always a, a very challenging risk assessment for us when we go to a fire in a vacant building around how aggressive we're going to get with regard to doing a, a search for a, a homeless that might be in there, for example, but knowing, not knowing the expected hazards that could be associated with the building. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Anything further from the council? Yeah. Um, given the status, the, the recommendations from the, the city attorney, hearing from the folks, I would like to make a motion and I think the reason that I think the best chance of mitigation of this property and the best chance of a fair resolution for the neighbors and the property owner would, I'm gonna make a motion to postpone till the next council meeting this order. That will give the gentleman, Mr. Zahir, a chance. The dumpsters are coming on Wednesday. They can get after it. And if the neighbors come and say they've done an incredible job, then maybe we can reconsider this in, in the next meeting. And if not, I don't think we're putting off. I think that's the best chance for mitigation at the very least of the property. So, and if that's not what the council wants to do, it's not gonna hurt my feelings, but I'm gonna make that motion. So, I would, I would Councilor say. Milk says, uh, move to postpone until the next regularly scheduled council meeting as her second. I would second that, and I think it gives the, the owner some time to prove himself after two years of neglect. Um, two weeks of super effort perhaps may change the course of this discussion. 
So the amendment has uh, been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion on the amendment by the council? Uh, council Gary. Point of information. Can this type of motion be amended to add something to the conditions? You mean the main motion? When we get to vote on this, could we add, I would like to amend it to say that the only way that I will approve a two week per, per yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, this is the, one of the first things that's got me rocked and not in a good way. The only way I will support this is if he hires somebody to be a security to make sure that nobody's on the property and around and has no way of getting anybody in there. Are you offering that, uh, Council Gary, is uh, an amendment to the amendment that's on the floor? Yes. Is there a second? The motion fails for lack of a second. Is there further discussion from the council about the amendment uh, that Councillor Milks has put forth to postpone this item to the next regularly scheduled council meeting? I, I got a quick question that may assist Councillor Gary and part of the rest of them. Is it, uh, Mr. Cousins, is, is this building so currently? At this point, the discussion is limited to the amendment that's on the floor. So let's discuss the amendment um, after we um, deal with the amendment. If there's further discussion about the main motion, we can have that. Is there, is there further discussion about the amendment? The council ready for the question? Vote will be by show of hands. All in favor? Opposed? Four having voted in the affirmative and two in the negative, the motion is adopted. So we're now back to the main motion. That's, sorry, where the motion has been uh, adopted and the item will be postponed until um, April 1st will be the next regularly scheduled meeting. Thank you. We'll move on in the agenda to the next item. Um, Order 4003182024, adopting the City of Auburn's fee schedule. This is tied to the prior um, motion. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just want to, I just want to make one more comment. I know that yeah. the motion's already been passed and postponed, yeah. but I don't want him cutting down trees in that environmentally sensitive so, area. So, so you should talk to Mr. Cousins okay. about any items regarding the work there from the planning office. So this would be adopting the Auburn uh, City Fee Schedule. This is a follow-up from the prior unfinished business item to now place the fee schedule uh, as an attachment to the city ordinances. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Whiting, seconded by Councillor Walker. Is there a discussion? Is the council ready for the question? Vote will be by show of hands. All in favor? Opposed? Six having voted in the affirmative, none in the negative. The motion is adopted. <clears throat> is there any other, un, uh, excuse me, new business to come before the council? We'll move on to uh, the next agenda item, which is an open session. If any member of the public would like to address the council about city business not on tonight's agenda, please approach the podium and provide your name and address. Not seeing any, we'll close the open session and move on to reports. For the mayor's report, I have two quick items. Um, there was a law pack meeting earlier uh, this week in which WRS Environmental provided um, the results of their study regarding phosphorus control in the, in the lake. Um, if anyone's interested in um, this um, report, you can go to the law pack which is the Lake Auburn Water Protection Commission website, and look at the March 13th agenda. I think WRS did a very thorough report, and for people that have interest in the water quality in the lake, it's uh, a good report to read. 
The second item, I would just say, we briefly mentioned this earlier, the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness met um, first meeting last Thursday and will be meeting uh, every two weeks for the next couple months. And we'll start with uh, Councilor Geary for Councilor reports. Don't have any Councilor reports yet. <laughs> In Council line with your discussion about the lake, um, I note the earliest uh, ice out that I can remember, uh, although I did see a little ice on the, the uh, what would it be the western, northwestern side towards North Auburn a couple days ago, but it's, it was out, uh, I believe it was the 12th probably the earliest in history. Council Cowan? No reports tonight. Council Milk? No. Nope. Council Wiseman? No. Nope. Council Walker? None. <laughs> Mr. May, uh, manager. Thank you, Mayor. Council, I think you have at your, your desk. If not, we'll make sure we have them available. Just two items that are coming up that our communications director asked I pass along. The conservation, Auburn Conservation Working Group is going to hold a webinar on Tuesday, March 19th at 6.30 p.m. Encourage folks to visit the website um, to get more information about that. And it's about providing a pollinator habitat uh, within backyards and within the community. Uh, the second item is a, a save the date for Saturday, April 13th uh, from 10 to 1 p.m. It's a land use forum. This will be at the uh, Auburn Senior Community Center. And this is being hosted by the Auburn's Natural Products and Agricultural Working Group. Uh, they'll be hosting that. Um, again, you can join the website and you'll see more information on those two items. That's all I have. Thank you. And for the public, there's no executive session this evening, so is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to move. Second. And moved by Council Walker, seconded by Councilor Meltz. All in favor? Opposed? We'll stand adjourned.